Coming up on Digital Music Trends 173, recorded on the 5th of March 2014, Beats Music and Topspin, Ministry and Spotify, Gema and YouTube, Apple wants more Beyonces, Australia's wars, Amazon's streaming service rumors and much more. This week's show is brought to you by Omniphone, the leading B2B cloud music provider powering global music services including Sony Music Unlimited, Guvera, Rara and Sirius XM. Find out more on Omniphone.com. And by MusicGraph, the world's first knowledge engine for music, available as a consumer app and as a graph API for developers. Check out MusicGraph.com or developer.musicgraph.com. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends. I'm Andrea Lionelli and this is the weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry. And DMT is available as a video and audio show on a variety of channels including the iTunes Store, most podcasting apps including Downcast, YouTube, SoundCloud, Mixcloud and many more. To get in touch with the show you can tweet us on at Music Trends or get in touch by contacting contact at digitalmusictrends.com via email. Your feedback and word of mouth are essential in circulating the show so it'd be great if you you enjoy the show today if you can tweet it out or uh, spread it around uh, in your circle that would be fantastic and uh, uh, this week it's a real pleasure to welcome to the show three great guests and uh, it's the first four-way show with a new setup so let's hope that it all holds up so uh, first of all we have Taishi Fukuyama from uh, P- a portal PRTL a representation and development agency for international businesses in technology entertainment and new media on PRTL.jp so thanks so much Taishi uh, I know it's 8 a.m. in San Francisco, so thanks so much for joining us. Always a pleasure. Thanks, Andrea. Definitely an, an early bird there. And uh, uh, it's a real pleasure to welcome back uh, Eric Eitel, who works on a bunch of different projects, including Berlin Music Week, and also a new project called uh, Music Pool Berlin. So hi, Eric, and thanks for joining us. What is Music Pool? Oh, it's a new uh, consultancy uh, publicly funded uh, that we do for musicians here in Berlin, but um, you might talk about it later on. Huh? Okay, great. Awesome. And last but not least, it's a real pleasure to welcome back Stefan Holly, back from the Fraunhofer Institute of Digital Media and Technology, where he is Head of Media Management and Delivery. So hi Stefan and thanks for joining us. How's it going? Hello, everything's fine. Great. And uh, we have a ton of stories to delve into today. But first of all, a quick note about South by Southwest uh, as uh, Digital Music Trends will be, as usual, covering from the event. And I've set up a page on SXX, uh, sorry, sxsw.digitalmusictrends.com where you can keep an eye out on the latest from Austin. And if you're going uh, to South by, please give me a shout and you're listening to the show. I'd love to uh, meet up. Uh, I'm moderating a couple of panels, uh, one on Monday uh, for Interactive, uh, titled How to Take Berlin and I have to thank Eric for that one actually and another one on Wednesday for music called Local Approaches in the International Music Market so if you are heading down there uh, please let me know it'd be great to uh, meet up and uh, uh, this week it's a pretty big week for news actually Uh, it's surprising but there's a lot to cover in the run up to South by and it's not South by related so first of all uh, uh, a news that broke yesterday and that's uh, Beats Music acquiring uh, the direct to fan platform Topspin of course uh, there were obvious ties between the two companies as a co-founder and CEO of Topspin, Ian Rogers left the company to head Beats Music and Beats had already announced an integration with the company's direct link platform allowing bands to sell merchandise via the streaming service. Topspin though had also uh, recently announced a partnership with Spotify which had raised some eyebrows because it kind of beat uh, Beats to the punch timings wise. So uh, it's pretty important to, to, to see what's going to happen now because the Spotify of course uh, used that as a sort of a central part of their artist-centric uh, strategy that's been unveiled over the last few months to try and uh, and uh, counter the criticism that was made against uh, against the service in terms of uh, revenues that were coming from it. So um, I want to ask you guys, uh, first of all, what do you think about this partnership, uh, this acquisition? Uh, Taisha, starting for you in San Francisco, of course, uh, uh, the companies are, are, are based in California. So what do you think about uh, this acquisition? Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? And maybe was it a necessary thing? Because Topspin, uh, as, as we know, wasn't going through uh, the best of times. They had some layoffs. and and perhaps the the company's financials weren't looking too good. Sure, all that is completely true. And um, in regards to what I think, I really wouldn't be too surprised if it wasn't actually um, already signed and delivered before all of this really happened. And um, in terms of if being able to buy tickets and merch is really, really that big of a service for the end user is really still to be on, it's still unknown. <clears throat> I think it's um, great that the services are very um, forward-thinking and integrating these services. Uh, perhaps it could be really great for the 
for the musicians, but maybe on, on a user experience uh, perspective, it can get, get really cluttered. So it, yeah. it's for a beats to, you know, that's really doing well in design. I'm looking forward to what that's going to be looking like on yeah. the apps. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Eric, in, in my opinion, it was kind of it's kind of weird because uh, uh, TopSim would have been the perfect platform to expand uh, across uh, a number of different uh, services mm -hmm. with the same type of, of, of level of service with the uh, direct link platform. Uh, you know, of course, uh, uh, TopSpin was quick to state that they would be uh, honoring the agreements they already have and that the Spotify uh, uh, partnership would continue for the foreseeable future, but we don't know for how long. And uh, so would the partnerships with MTV and CMT. O on your side, do you think it's uh, in Beats interest to have this uh, uh, service be an exclusive of, of Beats or would they benefit from it being available on other services as well? Mm. Yeah, first of all, I think it's a really uh, smart move to um, integrate or now to acquire this service like from the beginning because I mean, as we learned, for instance, Spotify had a lot of problems like with the artists and with opinions and I think uh, Beats made this very good move because I mean uh, I think these artist services are extremely important to build trust and, and add value for the relationship with the musicians and labels so uh, yeah. but um, as an exclusive deal of I don't know from an economic point of view I mean we don't know I mean maybe it makes sense to, um, to, to leave the service open to all other services and make some little extra revenue on this side why not I mean yeah. yeah, sure, should keep it open. Yeah, yeah, that, that's interesting. Uh, Stefan, on your side, do you think that uh, 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 Topspin will keep the service uh, 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 open to uh, Spotify and uh, competitors of Beats, or does it make sense for Beats to just close it down and have it as an exclusive uh, add-on for their own platform? Uh, especially, it's interesting uh, when they announced today that uh, the product manager of uh, Beats is going now to Spotify in the US. Right. So it's uh, vice versa. So uh, and I, I, I never really uh, understood the, uh, the business model of Topspin because they right. were uh, always related to artists which already have a clear vision into a, their digital future for uh, these guys who already know. And that's why we all know there is not, not that many uh, money uh, from independent artists available. Yeah. to uh, use that service as well. So I don't expect that this service, Topspin, will go on um, under the beat um, hood uh, to also deliver services to other um, outside things in yeah. the future. Yeah, so yeah. I think that that's, that's uh, maybe the acquiring knowledge um, mm. relations, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Not really business. I mean, it's going to be interesting to see, actually, um, uh, another story that uh, came out today was the fact that uh, uh, the company uh, Pledge Music has actually uh, done a bit of a shift uh, on its uh, homepage and shifting from the purely crowdfunding element to more of a direct-to-fan element, which uh, sort of directly competes with some of the services mm -hmm. that Topspin was offering. Mm -hmm. And so that it kind of comes out as an interesting alternative to Topspin for companies that want to get away from the Beats connection and may want to expand into mm -hmm. D2C services. And it's also interesting for, for Pledge because they have been so focused on uh, crowdfunding so far, and uh, this is a way for them to have crowdfunding crowdfunding as, as a tool in their arsenal, but it's not the only thing that's, that's uh, happening there. So Eric, uh, you know, I, I know our pledge have a quite a strong presence in Germany as well. Uh, well how do you feel about the, this transition for the company into going to a, more, a broader uh, D2C uh, provider? Um, to be perfectly honest, I don't have a, like a position on that. I mean, uh, right. obviously it seems to make sense, like um, from what we discussed um, uh, beforehand, like that we definitely need that kind of services around, like especially these um, for instance, a streaming business, and uh, therefore, yeah, sure, it makes total sense from yeah. my point of view, but I, I, I don't think I, I have like a strong position on that. Yeah. Eric, uh, sorry, um, uh, Taishi, on your front, uh, do you think uh, it makes sense for Pledge to uh, sort of broaden its uh, scope and become a, a, a more of an uh, all-inclusive D2C platform instead of just being seen as a crowdfunding platform? Sure. I think, um, well, as far as I know, um, Pledge Music has always tried to not be branded as a crowdfunding, but more direct to fan right. from day one. Yeah. And, um, and I think in those terms, maybe like their message hasn't really changed all that much. I see you know, know that the site has been revamped and maybe they'll build out some more features based on the direct to fan business models. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I think, I think it's a good thing. 
Yeah, I, mean, I, know, I know that Banjo has always uh, tried to get away from the the association with crowdfunding directly and, and try to be more of a, a D2C uh, proposition, but of, of essentially was seen as a crowdfunding model for, for, from, from right. others. Uh, and so, yeah, definitely a, an interesting development from them. I want to see what uh, what the future brings for, for the company and, uh, and uh, uh, whether it, it becomes a potential alternative to Topsin because Topsin really was fairly unique in, in its in its offering and also in the in the uh, uh, direct link that they had uh, with uh, with other platforms so definitely want to keep an eye on and uh, uh, back in September uh, when this story broke we covered it extensively after all Ministry of Sound uh, suing Spotify over intellectual property and playlist is a mouth wateringly good subject but uh, mm. it raised a bunch of questions around the value of curation the copyrightability of playlists and what would have happened if Ministry had actually won this lawsuit in terms of uh, other services coming into play and this week we heard that the, the two companies have come to a settlement so of course this is a positive development for the industry because it means that uh, we're not going to have to see um, a massive battle happening in the courts uh, but at the same time uh, I was quite looking forward to seeing uh, a precedent established in this area and seeing uh, mm -hmm. what, what the law in the UK was going to look like uh, if uh, uh, Spotify or Ministry had had won the case so uh, you know uh, Ministry of Sounds uh, has uh, so Spotify has agreed to remove uh, playlists uh, uh, based uh, uh uh, play playlist from its search engine and not remove the playlist completely so any any playlist that mimic Ministry of Sound compilations and have Ministry of Sound in the name will be removed from the search engine but not uh, as a playlist altogether which I guess is a relief for uh, users of the service and if, if it had been different it would have set a pretty dangerous precedent and also uh, it has disabled the follow functionality for those playlists in particular so uh, Stefan uh, uh, from, from your side do you think that uh, there is more to come when it comes to issues around a copyright of uh, curation, so copyright of playlists, so copyright of uh, an arrangement of tracks uh, uh, in, in, in the future? Uh, maybe it's, uh, of course, related to these, um, uh, not to the copyright of the music itself, but to the, to the copyright uh, of the brand. And That's of right. course, uh, it, it is very difficult. Uh, maybe uh, if you step on somebody's foot, maybe he... Uh, <laughs> He is maybe a little bit um, trying to get a little bit extra money out of a deal which he normally can't get, especially for licensing music uh, to Spotify, and that's a good pl uh, thing to do. So um, I don't really like uh, to 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 comment about this specific uh, discussion because it's really difficult. What was really the 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 issue which was uh, at the end yeah, on, on yeah. both interests? So it's it's. It's good that they have uh, made a, a decision for the future going together. And um, yeah, the only way how they could both come out with a, um, with a good solution is that they, uh, that uh, Ministry of Sound is going to introduce users uh, their fantastic compilations as playlists by themselves. So yeah. that, that would be good. Maybe or temporary, maybe not forever. But, yeah, um, I mean... I guess that that's that's a key issue of Ministry of Sound is that they don't own the majority of the recordings yeah. for those compilations and so they don't get any streaming revenues coming from services like Spotify or Deezer so in that sense it becomes a very difficult proposition. Uh, Eric, can, can you foresee any ways in which uh, Ministry of Sound can uh, find a business model that makes sense in which they can actually work with streaming services instead of going against them because you know the uh, the vast majority mm. of their income comes from uh, selling cds and selling digital downloads so mm -hmm. yeah well I, I would also strengthen the point i mean it's important that they find a solution i guess um playlists are like a backbone of all peer-to-peer -peer recommendations so there needs to be a solution and in this particular case again i it's hard to, to comment but I mean, it's it's so crucial to um, find a way out of um, this dilemma, and everybody needs to make its revenue, obviously. Uh, but um, playlists are key, like for all the streamers, for instance. That's yeah. for sure. Yeah, uh, Taishi, uh, in, in the US uh, and uh, uh, all over the world, uh, curation is becoming the keyword for uh, streaming services and we're seeing more and more people uh, talk about uh, how important and how valuable it is. And so, uh, but nobody has really, it's hard to put a dollar sign on what the curation's value is. So, uh, you know, w what do you reckon? We're going to see more litigations based around uh, people stealing each other's playlists or, or stuff happening uh, on, on the back end? Well, I think when you think about... Um like these curation sites, and they tend to be more media based. Yeah. Uh, the pitchforks, and they also they have alternate methods of revenue. 
And when you're looking at just a, a purely a list of texts that just has, you know, um, names of songs, it's really hard to copyright that. Right. And if that's your only source of revenue, of course, you know, you're, you're just going to be stuck in the past. So you have to really pivot and do a lot more. And if you're going to have to just give out those playlists for free and, and maintain your brand and keep it relevant, you need to find alternate ways of making money, I think, yeah. in these days. Yeah, absolutely, and uh, and so we're gonna we're gonna follow the case uh, uh, more uh, as uh, it develops because I, I don't think that ministry is done with Spotify. I know that uh, I was at a session a, few, uh, a couple of weeks ago where with a, a ministry representative was talking about uh, the fact that this issue was endemic to the to the streaming business and not just to uh, Spotify. So I, I wonder whether this uh, settlement will gonna give them courage to go after others that are having the same issues, uh, or whether the others are gonna just back down and agree to the same terms as Spotify. With without being taken to court. That's definitely uh, an interesting uh, thing that we're going to have to look out for. And uh, uh, a couple of interesting stories coming respectively from uh, Germany and from Japan. So it's uh, great to have you guys on uh, this week. So first of all, uh, we had an interesting development in the YouTube and Gamer Saga in Germany. But before I delve into that, for any German fans that are listening to the show, uh, DMT's YouTube channel is now finally available in Germany again, which is great. Uh, and yay! <laughs> <laughs> the mysterious ways of YouTube. I didn't contact anybody, uh, but uh, <laughs> but you know, back to the news. Uh, the Collecting Society won a pretty important battle, Gema, uh, uh, by getting a court uh, in Germany to rule that the notices displayed uh, when a video is made unavailable on YouTube were misleading, as they placed the blame on Gema itself. So the notices are read just so that people know what they said. Unfortunately, this video is not available in Germany because it may contain music for which Gema has not granted the respect respective music rights. Sorry about that. So, you know, for which GEMA has not granted the respective music rights. The, the, the bl uh, blame was placed on GEMA. Uh, in, in, if we go back to the, to the reason why so many videos are blocked in Germany, it's actually because there is an ongoing lawsuit between YouTube and GEMA on the use of a few videos. Uh, it's actually a few example videos, I guess, uh, that are uh, quoted in the court case. And uh, YouTube blocked all the rest of the videos that could contain GEMA-administered uh, copyrights in order to avoid further lawsuits. So, uh, it, you know, this is not something that GEMA has imposed on YouTube, but uh, the two companies lack a deal, and so YouTube essentially has to remove any tracks that could uh, uh, generate further lawsuits. Uh, it's, it's, it's a mess, but it's uh, interesting that this has happened because it could change the narrative in Germany, uh, at least because a lot of people are placing the, game, uh, the, the blame on GEMA because they've seen these notices over and over again over the last couple of years. Uh, so Eric, uh, you know, from, from Berlin, do you think that uh, this uh, is, is a positive note for GEMA? And, uh, where does it leave the, the negotiation? You know, I, 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 do you feel like there is any chance of a deal being being made uh, this year? Mm, to be perfectly honest, I, I totally uh, loved um, one comment I read about um, the um, um, the um, um, lawsuit. And uh, commentator said like, um, "Gema won the battle, but they lost the, the war." Um, I mean, obviously, um, this was like a um, good. Um, um, decision for, for Gamma, but I mean the overall uh, picture and opinion in the market from the um, end user uh, perspective is still so bad and, and everybody's like pointing at uh, Gamma that it's their fault, that um, content isn't available. So yeah, I, I would stick to this comment to say like, yeah, it's, it's okay, but it's, it's not a solution and for their image it doesn't change anything. Yeah. Um, on the other hand, I mean, we've um, seen that Google had signed um, a deal for Google Play Music in Germany end of last year and um, I, I read like comments that um, from, from um, Google's perspective they, they were pretty optimistic that they um, can consolidate their um, um, relations with Gamer so um, but I think you, you, you won't get any comments from Google at the moment I just <laughs> met them a couple of days ago and they were like okay no comments on anything. But, yeah, 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 of course. Uh, Stefan, from, from your side, do you think that uh, this saga has gone on way too long? And is there any blame to be placed at this point? You know, I've heard the uh, sides for YouTube, against YouTube, for Gema, against Gema. Uh, it's really difficult to work out uh, what's happening here. And I mean, I, uh, sort of instinctively, I have a bit, I, I kind of feel... Uh, uh, good uh, about the fact that Gema is putting up a bit of a fight, but it's, it has been going on for a long time. So, uh, so where is this heading? So, uh, first of all, I, I would agree that 
uh, such a such as uh, just a small battle you are winning is not changing your complete opinion. But at least they they have a dilemma uh, because if you understand gamer as a as a really um, a strong organization which is not able to compete to the clever public relation thing which is Google mm -hmm. and YouTube doing. So mm -hmm. uh, at least they have to put a stake in, into this uh, issue and at least it's right not to displaying something which they could uh, maybe change but the only f uh, guys who are responsible to, to, to really blocking automatically this content on the labels with the content ID because they are afraid of paying more in the future and that's why they are setting uh, simply uh, checking the box and saying if this will appear this music please YouTube stop that from playing and then YouTube is uh, um, uh, showing in this message that Gema is uh, um, guilty for that so that's a very critical situation and at least uh, as I heard also in Germany now nearly every music service and every video service has a deal with Gema so it's not difficult to close them yeah. yeah the main thing is that Google and YouTube won't accept that they are handled as a music service or as a service provider here in Germany they say we are a hoster and that's something I can understand from the rights perspective. If you are a musician or a rights holder, then you're not able to understand that, that the biggest music service in the world, the only one who's making really net profit is saying, no, that we don't care. We are only a hoster. So, um, yeah, so, so you can see it. there is a lot of things which have to be cleared in, in, in the next weeks, and I don't expect a solution for the next month, Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, sure. It's it's a, it's a difficult battle, and uh, it's one that uh, is also difficult for the labels in Germany because I know that, that there's a lot of workarounds, uh, mm -hmm. you know, on, on how to get the videos on YouTube because, of course, it's still very much used in Germany, even if uh, uh, some videos are not available. So labels are trying their but best. For the labels, it's very easy. For the labels, it's very easy. They don't have to check the box if they're yeah. uploading a video. Or, so or, they, they, or they categorize. Check the box. Or they categorize as not be music, like uh, I know that some labels are categorizing their videos as entertainment or cars or anything in order to bypass the block, so... Okay. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting one. Uh, Taishi, in Japan, did, was there any issues uh, when it came to the deal uh, between YouTube and, and the, and the uh, Japanese recording associations and, and, and collecting societies? Uh, was there any tension there or is it just wildly available and, and you know, of, of course, wildly popular? Um, well, you, YouTube is very rampant uh, in in terms of adoption as uh, the end user's music player these yeah. days for especially the younger crowd. And uh, there's still a very limited content set available on YouTube, although it's increasing pretty rapidly. Um, for YouTube to say that we're really just a, a container of content and not a service is pretty absurd, I think. And you know, considering that they all now have Google up music, whatever, whatever, I forget it's called. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> Google and, um, play music for... Play, like, all, yeah, <laughs> right? <laughs> and, and, and then they're, you know, when, they, when, they have, when they're in the position to really say something about payouts to artists and they, they say, you know, that there, there needs to be more content in order to have a better experience for the user and yeah. if there's no content, there's no experience to build. And then they're doing, you know, something completely different and, and blocking people and trying to negotiate lower fees. So, I don't know, it just feels like there's a lot of mixed messaging over there at Google, although they are very much in the driver's seat. Yeah, yeah, sure. And, uh, and uh, of course, uh, it's interesting in Japan, especially because the digital market is uh, still relatively weak and the physical market is so strong. So, of course, YouTube comes in as a, a player that doesn't have paywalls or anything like that. So it, it can be a pretty uh, appealing proposition to a younger audience that might not want to spend a lot of money on on CDs and might not want to end in trouble, end up being in trouble for pirating music. That's definitely one one key outlet, right? Question for me, right. because uh, what is the percentage of physical um, uh, things uh, they are uh, being sold in Japan? Because you said there is still a strong market. And yes. I think uh, Germany as well is very strong if you compare this to other digital markets. Mm. What is the percentage of digital goods they are uh, selling? Germany in and Japan are similar. Actually, uh, in, in okay. 2012, uh, uh, Japan was at 80%, I believe, and Germany was at 75 
And mm -hmm. so if we, if we look at this trend sort of continuing, I, I guess like probably Germany is about 70, uh, I think the last report is just below 70% physical, yeah. and Japan uh, probably, is, you know, 75 or something like that if it's dropped mm -hmm. a few okay. points. Uh, uh, I don't know if Taishi has got any different numbers, but that, that's the latest that I remember. So yeah, the Japanese so and the German guys are the physical ones. Yeah. And they are building the, the good cars, so, uh, so that is maybe something which is <laughs> and Japan, the reason why, the engineering or the, the haptic of things, I don't know. And Japan is the second world market with over 4 billion in revenue as of 2012, uh, if I remember correctly, and Germany is the number four, uh, so you know, the number two and number four in the world have such a, a strong physical market is, is, is pretty interesting. Uh, at least uh, in 2014, I think. And, and staying with Japan, uh, Taishi, I wanted to uh, ask you about this next story because I know nothing about it, uh, apart from what I read in the article. I'm quite uh, transparent about that. Uh, so the next web reports that uh, Dina, which is a Japanese gaming company, has uh, shut mm -hmm. down some key features of its music service Groovy, including streaming and downloads. Oh. So the company had launched Groovy last March, so the service had been live for a year following the acquisition of uh, the music app uh, Disco Deer. So, uh, you know, th does this uh, uh, tell us something about the prospect of streaming? streaming for Japan, or is it just a project gone wrong that never really took off? Um, short, uh, long story short, it's yeah. the latter. Okay. Um, <laughs> it, yeah, the company DNA is um, more to, I think it was one of their very first endeavors in the music space, but actually, if you look at the, the entire marketplace, um, there's actually a lot of domestic streaming services popping up in right. Japan. And this is kind of in response to um, Spotify really um, eyeing the Japanese market to launch. Uh, the rumors are have been that they're going to launch this year, and yeah. that's what one said last year too. So really, who knows? But but um, you know, th there's a lot of tension here. So the existing music players are really ramping up on their streaming game. Yeah, and so and, to, and are they licensing to streaming services, or are they trying to set up their own streaming services? Uh, what is happening? Uh, so the domestic content owners are giving the most to obviously the first to the domestic services first. Yeah. Um, Spotify have a, a small catalog of domestic songs. Um, they are available for like the, well Spotify is not actually available in Japan yet so the content is available for their international users. Right. And as for what the kind of content that's available in Japanese streaming services these days are still only up to like 1 million and, and a little bit tracks. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's interesting. And it's definitely going to be an interesting panel as well as South by We're going to talk about this uh, yeah. uh, at length. Uh, uh, so if you are around uh, on next Wednesday, I think, uh, yeah, on Wednesday, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, licensing uh, uh, local catalogs in, uh, internationally, which is quite a fascinating subject, so especially for uh, local services and services that are trying to expand really rapidly into hundreds of different territories without having uh, enough local catalog to go around. So uh, we'll keep an eye on this story and what's happening in Japan as well. And uh, uh, the next story is uh, uh, Apple, uh, and uh, there's a couple of ones actually around Apple this week. Uh, uh, but I'm going to start with I'm going to start with I'm going to start with the one about cars. Actually, it's, it's, it's quite a, it's quite a fun one. I think uh, I can definitely bring Stefan in that conversation thanks to his exper uh, previous experience uh, at. Uh, Opio. So uh, Apple has unveiled its uh, first real-life integrations of the CarPlay technology, which is a rebranding of the clunkily named uh, mm -hmm. uh, iOS in the car, which was first showcased at WWDC last year. But you'll have to uh, uh, have a well-stacked uh, wallet if you want to get one of those cars, because uh, uh, the first manufacturers on board are Ferrari, Mercedes-Benz and uh, Volvo, so uh, not cheap cars uh, by any means. Uh, the integration will allow users to interact with Siri, uh, so have any functionality that is available right now on iOS like sending messages but you also have a, a dashboard integration with Apple Maps so good luck to anybody that's trying to use those because uh, I haven't used it in a while but it was, uh, it was awful when I, when I tried to and that's what I was thinking <laughs> it's not the safest way to go I'd rather go with TomTom -tom, to be honest I'm in the car uh, and uh, um, uh, you know, they, they also give you the ability to control music, not just iTunes, uh, but also from apps like Spotify and iHeartRadio. And so, you know, uh, 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 Stefan, how do you see this move uh, uh, work within the car space? Uh, and do you think that high-end manufacturers came on board for any particular reason uh, or because of the brand or what's the take here? I think um, it's, it's a, of course, an active choice which Apple did. And on the other hand, I was uh, at two... 
telematics conferences last year uh, in, in Munich, the biggest one uh, in in in, uh, in autumn, and uh, they are going. Uh, the guys from the telematic industry and including all brand manufacturers and OEMs are talking about the connected car, and they have a big problem because uh, it's only theory, yeah. and they uh, they have to do a lot, but they are very afraid of bringing in in bringing in other operating system to the car because then they say we will lose the customer and they would like to keep the customer but the funny thing is that the users already decided they have their smartphones just bring your own device and the uh, and the most famous connection to the car system is the aux from 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 your uh, stereo output which you have uh, for your headphones <laughs> so you can simply plug in everything and and they are trying to build a lot of funny things, uh, the big brand manufacturers making their own apps, own stores and everything like that. And it's and it's really a dead end street. And yeah. very consequent, Apple jumps in and brings the iOS to the car. And this is something they are very afraid of, but at least they have to go with that. So mm -hmm. it's the end. They are choosing between two things they, they really don't want to do. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I think... This is a clever, a clever bridge with iOS in the car, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I, the, the fun, the most funny thing I, I saw it was the, the end of the last big telematics show when when the when the, when the analyst showed uh, how users trying to find a radio station in the car, and it was so so funny to see the uh, guys uh, searching for nearly ten minutes. Right. Or just a simple thing in a new HMI to search for a radio station. They were completely lost. And then they showed a simple interface from Tesla. This was just like a, a, a kind of a pad, which was in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the middle of the car. And it was that easy. Yeah. So and it, uh, I think they didn't spend that much time, just like the other engineers spent in the other car companies. And if you have Apple... As um, as the technology provider for such uh, systems, and an iOS system then in the car, that's that's okay, uh, but only for iOS users, and that's mm -hmm. a problem which, of course, the the, the other users will also have. Yeah. I was and about maybe, to ask, yeah, yeah. because um, I mean we've seen like um, um, Android, or Google Android uh, coming uh, up with their what was it called like um, Open Automotive Alliance at CES. Yeah, I mean, alliance. so I, Apple is like a late show here, or what? No, no, Apple is the first because they already have it uh, in in Ferrari and they will have it working. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, Google have to prove this, and they have the big problem. That uh, if you have the same system in in, uh, in the automotive environment, then you have to take care for all other Android devices. And this world mm -hmm. is very very fragmented. Right. So mm -hmm. Apple has the ability to keep everything under control that it's mm -hmm. working from the the devices users bringing in to the car and to everything. Also security, driver distraction guidelines, all these kind of things. Mm -hmm. uh, they can control together with the automotive industry, maybe also OEMs. But on the Android side. It must be a horror scenario because mm -hmm. as developers, if they are going to provide something to the Google Play Store, it's uh, three times the effort and uh, I think less than a, than a, than, than a third in income. Yeah. And um, yeah, you have to develop a lot. You have to maintain a lot of devices and you have less income. So it's a lot harder. But maybe mm -hmm. Google has the right way to... to choose maybe uh, two or three uh, signature partners and then they're going to introduce this in some car as well. Yeah. But for users with Android devices, it's definitely not a solution but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because these things are very, very fragmented. Oh, that, that was a fantastic Let's comment. Uh, yeah, super interesting stuff. And uh, mm -hmm. I mean, to be honest, uh, I would have loved, uh, it, from a completely irrational point of view, I would have loved Apple to buy Tesla, as the rumors <laughs> were uh, last month, because it would have made quite a lot of sense. But uh, yeah. as you say, Stefan, because they already have a technology that is quite advanced, mm -hmm. it doesn't make sense for them to buy Tesla just to gain a foothold in the car market, uh, even if it would have been an extremely cool acquisition. Uh, <laughs> and uh, Eric, you know, any, any thoughts on this? Do you think that uh, uh, Apple's play uh, could work out? And, and uh, you know, sh should we wait until they unveil a partnership with somebody like Ford or, you know, a more, uh, although... Ford down to like, earth. <laughs> yeah, down to earth uh, car manufacturer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this, this um, Android... Um, um, 
alliance, I think they have um, General Motors and, and Honda, for instance, um, as partners. But I think they showed up with like Audi, which is like, I guess, the yeah. cooler um, um, case to, to show at CES. But um, well, they, they went this way. So, yeah. But, but could you see like um, um, Apple um, um, or this, this, this CarPlay um, starting in a Ford? I mean, obviously not. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ford, if I, I think Ford have had actually, I, I mentioned Ford, but they've had a long standing relationship with Microsoft with the, with the Ford yeah, thing. Exactly. So, so I don't think they're going to go for that. But uh, maybe Fiat or somebody like that is, is going to be interesting mm -hmm. to see where they go with that. Uh, but Ford, Ford already changed because they're going to Q&X now. Oh, right. They are already leaving Microsoft, so going oh, to Q and X. Oh, what a shame! <laughs> Daishi, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. have you seen any 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 uh, Google cars in San Francisco driving around by themselves? Uh, not yet. Not yet. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, I know you're there quite a lot. <laughs> yeah, but um, a couple things interesting. I'm first of all very excited about this um, the connected cars for sure, and um, some things that are interesting in Japan that are that I wanted to share is that. For example, if you're using your windshield wipers for a long time, you know it, it. It means that it's raining, and maybe that it could detect, create automated playlists based on that kind of mood, or oh, okay. or like, if you're, or if you're going a certain speed, maybe you're on the highway and you're getting like a fast tempo playlist or something. So that kind of um, unique data that you can only get from a car to generate music experiences, I think, can be very interesting and and revamp what music can be. Yeah, as an experience in the car. Absolutely. And so, that, is that something that you're seeing uh, uh, being researched in Japan uh, by, by Toyota, for example? That's that's exactly what they're doing, oh, okay, and um, it's actually a, a, a mobile app right now in Japan called Music Chef. That's a streaming service, um, and it's very tied to cars. And I believe that that's the way um, it's going to head. That's that's awesome, man. Uh, you know, uh, yeah. it, it makes total sense. You know, for example, if you have a family of four, and you know, if 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 it's just one driver that goes on and it regulates the seat in a certain position, then he knows that it's it's the the, the husband or or the wife. And if there's kids at the back, then it's going to be a different playlist. It's it's it, 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 there's a lot of stuff that can be done around that, and and I'm sure that we're only about to, uh, we're only scratching the surface on what can be done. Uh, but I, I'm a little worried about security, to be honest. I mean, if we're having all these phones connected to cars and all these different operating systems, uh, I mean, I, I'm I'm not a coding expert. I'm sure, I'm sure there's a the more coding there is around these things, the more there's the potential for some massive exploits and bugs happening. So <laughs> I don't feel too safe about that. But you know, we're just, just we're just gonna have to trust uh, that developers uh, and 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 the software is being uh, re and re and re and rechecked a uh, uh, hundred times before it's it's uh, put out in the open. And uh, uh, today it's actually a veritable tour of the world. Uh, oh, actually, no, sorry, well, I've had another Apple store which was pretty big, which I should talk about. Uh, Otherwise, you know, I'm going to get uh, people emailing and saying, why didn't you talk about this? Uh, so and, um, it's an exclusive story published on Billboard that revealed this week that Apple's chief of music, Robert Kondrick, has been publishing, uh, uh, pushing executives uh, at majors to give them uh, more Beyonce-style exclusives in order to push sales on the platform. So uh, the company is reportedly mm -hmm. asking for a windowing system on such releases so that uh, they would not be available on streaming services, at least at the beginning, like mm -hmm. Beyonce's. You know, Beyonce's is still not on Spotify here in the UK. Uh, though the company seemed open to the release being available on other digital stores for sale instead of just being a complete exclusive to iTunes. Uh, it's a very tempting offer being available on, on sale uh, on iTunes as a sort of front page uh, uh, takeover style thing on the iTunes store worldwide. It's, it's really a valuable proposition uh, although it does uh, sort of clash with the idea of trying to get the music to as many people as possible which you can do through streaming services. So it's a, it's a tempting offer but uh, I wonder whether this is something that uh, I wonder whether this is something that uh, the uh, uh, the company should uh, that that uh, majors should really look at, uh, unless they have really a, a complete uh, you know a winner like uh, Beyonce that has this uh, underground thing that she managed to keep under wraps and then gets released uh, all of a sudden. So I don't know, uh, Eric, do you see this uh, tactic ever working again? I mean, it's been done once. The next mm. release is not going to. Yeah, I was about to say. I mean, it's it's like a it's uh, I, I would um, say it's just a counter strike like from from the downloading portal. Like we've seen it like um, I don't know brands doing it. Samsung and and Jay Z did some exclusive launches. We've seen a lot of um, pre-sale campaigns by by streaming providers. So 
I think it's just a logical step that they also try to do that kind of um, sales strategies. I mean, nothing wrong with it. And it's about like, um, how should I say? Um, it's 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 a business. It's a business case, you know. So um, yeah, why shouldn't they? I mean, okay, style is maybe an issue here, but um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, besides style, I mean, nothing wrong with it. I'd say. No, exactly that. Uh, Th Th do you think that uh, there is a an argument here that uh, you have to get make the try and make the most money you can make and if apple offers that platform that allows you to get the most album sales uh, out of a release then that's where you should go uh, or is there also an argument where you should have your artist music available as well as possible so that if uh, uh, you know fans want to come to a gig and they are on spotify or they're on Deezer, they can actually listen to the tracks beforehand without having to go and buy them separately or, you know what's your take on all this i think um well in terms of window windowing the release, like putting it on iTunes first exclusively, I think used to make sense. And right now, like your core consumer, your hardcore fans are already paid subscribers on the streaming services. Yeah. And you know, if if you don't have your content there when it's available, they're either gonna steal or maybe just even like forget about that artist. Yeah. So I think the, the one of the priorities on where to release first in this window is definitely the paid subscri subscriptions. And then if anything, let's pass on the free, free tiers and let them have it later. Because like the, the fans that, are, you know, that have iOS accounts doesn't really mean that they're the hardcore music fans. It can be anybody. And um, sure, it's a, lot, it's a higher profit margin, but if you are looking at a little bit more longer term on yeah. how to like nurture your hardcore music fans, I think right now you really can't ignore your paid subscribers on these subscription services. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Uh, Stefan, uh, are you, do you agree with uh, with Aisha on that? And uh, uh, is there is there any point? You know, uh, is Apple just trying to essentially uh, uh, revive uh, uh, a download business that is slowly, very slowly, but it's, it's starting to decline? Yeah, I'm, of course I, I I would agree, but normally I don't care about that issue really that much because um, it's it's for the already big mega stars and they can maybe make a little extra money and it's for the relation. It's a kind of brand marketing uh, which Apple could do to yeah. solve some problems. But in general, for music consumption overall, it's 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 not a solution. It's nothing. I don't care. It's uh, yeah. I don't care about Beyonce and all these things. That's, uh, I would love. Absolutely. I would love to see a music service who really takes care about uh, what can I exp or what can I discover for uh, what will be the next wave or, I, or that they could maybe say, yeah, we were the first. We have done something for that culture or, yeah, that would be something I would watch, but not that type of game. I'm not that music industry related that I would love to see more of these um, yeah, mega things running. <laughs> so they can do and it's okay they have the money and that's yeah. yeah yeah but, but it's not we have all the perspectives in now with all the perspectives yeah, in now <laughs> yeah that's why he chose us <laughs> and it's also like a one one case one case study does not uh, a, a, a theory on, on sales make so you know it's, it's kind of like we, we've seen beyonce do very well with this uh, i'm really interested in seeing if there's going to be yeah, other exactly. uh, artists that do uh, just as well and how that mm. works and how they decide to release the album uh, that that's going to be uh, a number of things that come into play on this. Uh, yeah. uh, if it's if it's just a normal pre-release with a pre-order and stuff like that, then it won't work. But if it's a, mm -hmm. an ambush campaign, then it has to be done at the right time where people are willing to spend the money and there's really demand for that artist's music. So a lot of factors to come into play here. Uh, and uh, today, uh, as I was saying before, and then I, I kind of uh, got waylaid by my own uh, um, lack of organization uh, for today, uh, but it's a veritable tour of the world on uh, DMT as we also uh, talk about Australia so uh, you know uh, not a huge amount to say aside from just uh, talking the numbers but uh, uh, ARIA the Australian Recording Industry Organization uh, Association that or uh, um, uh, tracks uh, of course uh, uh, these matters on, on numbers and sales and recorded music revenues uh, uh, showed that uh, overall recorded music revenues fell in 2013 by over 11 percent in Australia so that's a big blow uh, for the market it's, it's you know it's one of the biggest industry uh, music uh, markets in the world and uh, it had a promising four percent increase in 
in its mm. uh, its revenues in 2012 and so an 11 percent drop is really something uh that you know nobody really expected uh the physical market went down 25 percent in just a year uh, which is uh, really remarkable and uh, uh so, um, downloads uh, went up a 0.5 percent so uh you know kind of uh, starting to plateau a little bit here uh downloads uh, uh, sorry streaming uh, doubled so it's great uh, but it's still uh, just under six percent of the overall market so it's still a very small percentage of the overall revenues in the country so um <coughs> Uh, you know, it, I, I just don't know where this came from. I would love to have somebody mm -hmm. from Australia uh, explain to me what happened in the market, if there were any uh, reasons why there was that increase in 2012 in terms of releases of local artists or something that really spurred an increase and then this is just a normalization of the market back to where it was uh, in 2011 or whether this is uh, uh, due to any other uh, elements that came in in the, in the process. Uh, I don't know if you, you guys have anything to add to this because it's an Australian story, but if you have any comments, please do come forward and uh, uh, talk about it. Anybody? No? Yeah, I didn't think Maybe so. Maybe too much bush fire, bush fires in the... In oh, so people are not uh, going to shops anymore? So I don't know. But, yeah. Um, yeah Environmental it's, it, factors, it, I mean, why not? Yeah. And some, sometimes you have maybe... To, it's it's maybe a time which is maybe over. That is uh, something um, I, I've read today that the, the, the overall PC market is down ten percent, which is uh, an enormous uh, amount of uh, value which is uh, not spent by by users. Right. And uh, maybe if users don't spend music, uh, it's also that the music has not that relevance in the society at the moment so it's, it's more relevant to do something else so be on social media going out meet with friends or doing something else so that's also a typical thing which you which you have to acknowledge and, yeah. and that's my assumption i have so that sometimes if if music is not that relevant in society then of course it keeps losing uh or it, it, it goes on and, and, and losing uh not only relevance but also value and I mean, that's yeah i mean i totally agree on the, on the sense that people are distracted these days and there's this, like there's a hundred different things that one can do on a mobile phone instead of listening to music and uh, and so people choose to spend especially spending money you can spend money on apps you can spend money on anything else but in terms of the, like the actual relevance of music then that's mm -hmm. a different ar argument i'm not sure i agree that music is less relevant i just think that people are distracted in the way in which they actually choose to uh, spend their disposable income uh, i think music is just as relevant as it was before and maybe even more because you know we, we can see like the billions of streams that uh, videos get on youtube but in terms of it i think the the uh, the relevance maybe is on is on a uh, earnings uh, perspective if people decide that spending two bucks on 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 getting an add-on into into a, a bubblegum game or, or any any sort of uh, new uh, uh, fad on the on the iphone that it's more valuable than spending two bucks uh, uh, subscribing to a music service or or, or or buying a couple of tracks so uh, I, I don't know i mean that's my takeaway from from it um i don't know if uh, taish you have any anything to add of this or, or eric um, but I don't have much to no. put on the awesome Great. thing. Mm -hmm. Awesome. No. Well, uh, and uh, one <laughs> and I don't want to argue that the weather in Sweden is worse than in Australia. <laughs> 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 I think also Australia. Uh, one other thing is that Australia has uh, has seen a huge number of services uh, flood the market uh, uh, relatively quickly uh, in you know the last uh, sort of eighteen to twenty four months. Uh, we've seen a lot of streaming services coming to play uh, for what's really. I mean, it's it's a large market in terms of uh, economics, but it's a relatively small market in terms of population so if you start to see a lot of people switching to uh, access based consumption instead of uh, buying physical uh, mediums like like it seems to to be happening uh, then that decline is pretty sh pretty quick because the population is not actually that great it's just that that population was spending a lot more than the average uh, person on music uh, on a yearly basis so uh, it's really going to be interesting to see what happens on, on that front uh, one more company that is trying to in, you know I'm talking about hundreds of services that are flooding the marketplace one more service that is trying to <laughs> now enter the music streaming service streaming area is uh, Amazon apparently uh, that's according to uh, Peter Kafka Rico that posted industry mm. sources stating that Amazon is having conversations with labels around the possible launch of a music streaming service uh, uh, which could be potentially bundled with its uh, Amazon Prime subscription uh, of course mm. uh, as, as a piece is by Peter I'm, I'm, I'm taking it as a hard fact as he's uh, pretty awesome and never misses a beat uh, and, and now Amazon has uh, you know uh, 
a very interesting position because they're trying to uh, they're trying to be uh, you know the source of your uh, of everything you buy essentially you know you can buy almost anything from Amazon especially in the States uh, they're trying to be your video service uh, you know they already have a very strong presence in the music space uh, and uh, you know they also sell their own devices so you, you can consume uh, content buy content all from uh, the Kindle uh, and uh, supposedly they're gonna have a phone coming out at some point uh, according to rumors and uh, maybe perhaps even a TV style device that's gonna integrate in that as well so uh, definitely a company that's uh, looking at expanding big but at the same time the costs of a streaming service are pretty high and uh, that'd be pretty hard for them to fit that into the Amazon Prime subscription even if they raise the price of it and also the margins on that would be ridiculously small if non-existent it'd probably be a loss leader mm -hmm. uh, and Amazon even if they only try to make a small margin on, on things they, they always do try and make sure that they make some money even if it's a tiny amount and that that kind of scales uh, uh, unless you know uh, they, they are really launching a new model like with the Kindle where they, they started by losing money and then uh, mm -hmm. ended up uh, starting to make some money so I don't know uh, it, it's it's a difficult one uh, uh, Taishi do you think that uh, Amazon should go into music streaming does it make sense as part of the strategy or is it just uh, one more thing that people are not really don't really care about as part of the Prime subscription um, <clears throat> I think uh when when I first read about this, it just made me think, oh, they, their phone is ready, right? Right. So in order to really sell their devices, like getting music on there is really just a natural fit. Um, so that's that's the one, the first thing that really came to my mind. And about the Amazon Prime services, um, I also read somewhere that you know a lot of their shipping fees costs are are going higher. So in order to kind of justify the the, the increase of costs giving them you know access to free music uh, is probably maybe one of the things that they're looking to do to kind of maintain their ARPU on their users. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And also it could be interesting if they charged everybody a higher price and then <laughs> they earmarked uh, say 20 bucks a year for each of the users for the music service and then you know maybe like say that more than half of people on Amazon Prime wouldn't actually end up using it then you know maybe it would offset the costs that way you know just on, on a scale sense uh, counting on people actually not using it uh, heavily and just a portion of the users uh, using it <laughs> which is a, a tricky maths to do I'm sure uh, uh, Eric on, on, your, on your end do you think that uh, uh, you know if, if Amazon was uh, do you have Amazon Prime in Germany actually no I don't think so ah right oh, cool. yes yes we have it oh you have it okay. oh, it's new we have it okay yeah we the Prime is uh, existing for I think several years but right. now they have included last week uh, ah. The, the love video, which is a kind of a Netflix thing, into the Prime, and I That's thought right. on Monday if I if I would subscribe to Amazon Prime, and I I stepped down on Monday, but maybe in two months <laughs> it's different. <laughs> yeah, now I, was, uh, now I was about to say when I when I um, when the news came uh, popped up. I mean, obviously, well, I thought it was a natural move for this perfect or it's a perfect um, ecosystem to actually. Yeah, just uh, um, um, implement such a service. I mean, nothing wrong with it. And also um, regarding um, economic power or um, um, resources, I mean, this is also, again, a, a natural player that can actually sort of afford or, or has the power to, to, to uh, launch such a service. And, and if they have like uh, also devices now, I mean, why not? Even if it's not like a, a, bit, uh, a big um, a profit center. At the yeah. beginning, I mean, nothing wrong with it. I love it. I, I, I want to see Jeff Bezos <laughs> going, why not? What the hell? It's just, yeah, it's, yeah. Let's just hey, come on. <laughs> we got money. I don't, that's, that's, that's 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 stuff. <laughs> I don't think I'd rather, that, it's like, he's I'd rather listen to him. Yeah. Yeah. I think he, he, has a, he has a clever idea how to <laughs> integrate that service into the whole Amazon space yeah. Yeah. at all. And, and at least if they are going to think, how do you bring parcels over the air in the future? Uh, then they should uh, ask yourself the question: Why you don't bring music over the air? Because it's <laughs> <a step. laughs> yeah. I think yeah. they have they have a plan, and definitely it makes sense. Especially if you're already a cus uh, Amazon customer, um, if you're buying CDs, if you are already uh, being on a, on, a, on a video on demand service, streaming service with Amazon, then. And then it definitely makes sense. Yeah. If they are going to cross-finance this with something else, let's see. But also they have one of the biggest um, technological infrastructure in the world 
with all their Amazon services. And I think uh, they can manage that quite good. And I think they have a plan. Yeah. Let's see. It's good. Another competitor. Yeah, I have I have Good a rant though. I have a rant coming because exactly. uh, uh, they switched uh, the Love Film account in the UK as well into Amazon's mm. Prime thing, uh, mm. even for subscribers of the separate service. Because essentially they purchased uh, purchase for for the benefit of international listeners. They purchased uh, this company called Love Film in the UK, which uh, was uh, yeah. essentially Netflix, uh, the equivalent of Netflix, and it still ships the DVDs as well as part of the service. So they purchased that company uh, a, a while back. Uh, they started integrating the login side of things, and then uh, suddenly. Suddenly, it switched uh, into uh, Amazon's own ecosystem, but they switched the entire uh, concept to Amazon. So even the TV apps, uh, uh, iPad apps, everything shifted to Amazon Instant Video. Uh, and it's very confusing because, of course, you have people coming in from Prime that are getting free access to the to the videos, but then you also have the DVD rental component, which has been integrated within Amazon, which it wasn't meant to do, and it wasn't really built for that, so it's not working properly. All the TV apps apparently are broken, or the vast majority of them are. I, can't, I haven't been able to access the service for a week. Uh, so it's definitely not a smooth transition uh, for Amazon onto this uh, new venture, and uh, uh, definitely a very confusing one, I think, for customers mm. of the previous service. So uh, hopefully they'll fix it, but definitely a, a crappy user experience uh, for the switchover, and uh, something that Amazon should have probably tested beforehand before going live with everybody and just shifting everybody to the new model. But, you know, it's one of those. Maybe they just want to piss people off enough from the original service that they stop subscribing to the DVD shipment because it's probably just a pain mm -hmm. in the butt for them and then they can just switch everybody over to Amazon Prime and then forget about it. <laughs> that's a plan. That's probably yeah. that's probably the master plan of Amazon right now. So, uh, yeah. And uh, <laughs> Well, I, I think uh, we talked about videos and I, I think a, a good way to end the show uh, with the last story would be to talk about Xbox Music. Uh, there was a bit of, a, a bit of an off, off the beaten track story uh, yesterday about Xbox Music announcing the addition of 92,000 high definition music Music videos uh, which are actually on the platform already associated with the corresponding audio track so uh, this only works for Xbox one subscribers that are also premium users of Xbox music so they pay the nine pound 99 a month or nine dollars 99 a month uh, and uh, what happens is that if you have if you're playing a playlist uh, on the Xbox on your TV uh, and it includes one of the 92,000 tracks that has a uh, video associated with it the video will start playing alongside the track instead of just the the artwork and the visual uh, uh, of the of the of the, of the CD so it's a pretty interesting uh, offer. It's it's interesting because uh, companies are really struggling these days to differentiate their streaming service from one another. And I think uh, you know every, uh, everybody's putting the, the finger on curation and, and uh, putting the focus on curation, which is fair enough. But there's also interesting other ways in which a company like uh, uh, Microsoft that has a, a foothold in the uh, living room of, of so many millions of people, it can integrate uh, its, its video presence within the music service to, to make a more compelling experience. So, uh, uh, Eric, do you think that uh, it's kind of weird to, to listen to a playlist uh, on your Xbox and then suddenly get the, the videos? Uh, can it be awkward if your mom is walking around and you're like a teenager and there's like uh, it's just, you know, Miley Cyrus videos playing on there? What's going to happen? Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, this is again like uh, like a closed shop solution, but obviously uh, other um, streamers, like for instance here these um, Empire guys here in Germany, also like um, started their streaming um, um, offer um, and integrated um, um, video content as well. Um, Google Play Music obviously also has the potential to to integrate um, um, multimedia content. So yeah. I mean, it's it's cool. It's 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 nothing I, I'm really um, attached to, but um, I, I guess um, if people have the uh, or if, if companies have the content, uh, they're gonna use it. So um, yeah, yeah, we'll see that this is coming and. Um, It'll be all over the place, obviously. No, I mean, I think it's, it's a good move. Like, it just it just gives re people another reason to subscribe. And Microsoft has been very slow with the music service. They mm -hmm. only added uh, caching uh, to their iOS app uh, on, uh, in January of this year. So before that, you couldn't even cache tracks to the iOS app, which is pretty terrible for for music streaming service. And uh, uh, Taishi, do you think that uh, we're going to see more companies trying to, to, to go a 360 on, on multimedia content and trying to integrate video aspects to their music streaming services in order to provide a more compelling uh, offering to the, to the subscribers? Uh, definitely. Um, I think music videos are much going to be very close to the default in terms of user experience. Um, it, it only really makes sense. It actually makes less sense now that you really can't see them, you know, considering the yeah. fact that how, how much <laughs> that, you know, YouTube has made on, on music consumption and experience. 
Yeah, it's, it's, it could be an interesting space. I mean, I, I don't know how much... It's just a question of understanding how many people actually want to see the videos alongside the music, right? Uh, it could be a dis distraction or a, an annoyance, and uh, I guess if you have the option to turn them on and off, then it's fine, but uh, uh, it's... One more thing on that, like, I think one of the problems kind of... Um is that music is not distracting enough. You know, it's right. like you're able to like listen to music and cook and drive and do all these things. But um, the, the reason why people, you know, flock to YouTube is like, it's because of like that visual component and like, and not only just for just listening music. Yeah. That's, it's very, le you know, lean forward. You have to really get hands in to actually listen to it, but people go to it for, for a certain reason. Yeah. Yeah, sure. No, that that makes sense. And uh, uh, Stefan, on your side, uh, do, do you think that uh, uh, there is uh, some benefit in uh, uh, looking outside of the box and uh, and uh, finding alternatives uh, to uh, the, the the curation aspect that everybody's banging on about uh, for, for for the last few months and finding ways to uh, provide an alternative experience to users? Uh, the funny thing I read is uh, uh, that somebody said in Germany, "Hooray, MTV is back." So, uh, so <laughs> the Xbox is in the living room, and I think it's 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 a good idea maybe to to link this together. Uh, maybe not. I don't know. What I would love to see is uh, if they are always going to talk about the high definition content, but the high definition is maybe also possible for audio. And so if you right. have already something which is in the living room, I would assume that they could use this for high definition audio as well. Because, uh, for instance, a, a gamer, if he's really into gameplay, then he is going to download the, the soundtrack for the game or listening to this game in, in, in high quality already when he's playing offline. And a good quality online would be a good solution. But uh, a lot of services struggling with this HD component in audio, but in video, it's it's uh, it's an argument. So it should be also an argument for audio as well. Yeah. So if it's already in the living room, so they can do everything. Now they choose to do it with uh, choose to do it with uh, video, high definition. Okay. Um, it's maybe natural, but um, I would love to see high definition audio. Yeah. As well. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's, that's a good point. Uh, we're going to see a, a little bit more on high-definition audio at South by Southwest as Neil Young is uh, poised to unveil his new Ooh. service, Pono. Oh, no. uh, <laughs> and he will, he will bring his new device as well, so maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, I, I want to see what, the, what this Pono service is going to be all about and, and see if, if it has a, a potential to have a future uh, as part of the music ecosystem. But uh, I think that's pretty much uh, it for this week. But uh, of course, I uh, cannot end the show without asking you guys about uh, what you're working on and what we should be uh, talking about uh, uh, on, on the show for, from your end. So, uh, Eric, uh, from, from your end, you've worked a lot on the on the music uh, house, uh, on the German house uh, at South by Southwest. So, what, what's going to happen there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I, I was about to say, I mean, what I can warmly uh, recommend, like this um, panel discussion that we have at the German house next Monday with uh, Andrea Leonelli uh, moderating, we have um, fine um, companies from um, Berlin showing off their like uh, native instruments, um, Alpeo, um, but also um, newcomers, um, Nagio Sounds, they just showed off um, at um, Medium Lab and um, some other great um, startups that we're going to present uh, Monday night um, in our startup corner there. So it would be great to um, see a lot of you guys um, coming um, to um, the German house um, at South by Southwest. That's awesome. And yes, yeah, of course, I, I'm going to be there. And if anybody uh, comes down, please come and say hi. And uh, uh, Taishi, you're also heading down and we're going to have an interesting discussion on the panel. Uh, aside from that, uh, what are you working on? Or what do you want to wanna plug? Um, well, actually, this is really not a plug, but uh, uh, the Music Hack Day actually came to Japan last month. And um, I had the uh, really nice opportunity to, to organize that in Japan. And uh, the, the turnout was great, and the developer community is very bright, vibrant. So if anyone really wants to get in to see what their opportunities are in Japan in terms of uh, providing APIs or looking for partnerships, I would really love to um, get in touch. Hopefully we'll meet South by Southwest. That's great, and, and, I guess, uh, and of course, if you want to catch uh, the hacks that were created at, uh, at the Hack Day in Tokyo, you can go on uh, musichackday.org, and I'm sure you'll find all the links from there, and also on Hacker League, they're going to have all the links to the projects uh, and, and all this stuff by heart, because of course, I've done so much coverage of the Hack You're Days correct. in the past. <laughs> uh, one, more, one more thing, uh, sorry to, to, to jump in again, sure, but obviously, there's also a Berlin Music Week coming up uh, yes. in September, so 
guys, if you're interested in um, like um, catching up and uh, talking about Berlin Music Week, come in here um, to town and um, show what you did in music and tech. Um, also contact me. That's great. Thanks. Fantastic. And yeah, I'll throw links in the show notes uh, to all, all of these uh, nice things as well. So that if you've missed uh, any of the addresses or you're on a jog or at the gym, I can, you can go and catch up on, on what we talked about. And uh, Stefan, on your side, what, what are you working on, uh, on, on the, at Fraunhofer and uh, what, uh, what's exciting you at the moment? So I'm very excited about my preparation to going to Austin, of course. And I would like to mm-hmm. catch up, also meet up with uh, Taishi. So hopefully we will yes. meet us in person. Mm-hmm. That would be right. great. And on the other side, at the same time, uh, when um, Austin and South by Southwest is taking place, we have the CBIT, not to forget. The CBIT, uh-huh. one of the biggest computer shows, uh, will take place in Hanover. And of course, traditionally, Fraunhofer has a big booth there as well. And this year, we will talk about plagiarism and all that kind of stuff. So, for instance, if you want to see how you can manipulate or detect manipulations from uh, famous politicians or uh, other guys uh, and which could be um, a good benefit also for the future, how you can detect plagiarism in music, so they could get an information on our booth there. And uh, the interesting thing is what we are at the moment observing is the discussion about these famous Erdogan interviews from the Turkish Premier Prime Minister. He's talking a lot of things and nobody knows if he really was it or not. So yeah, we will also relieve a cover, uh, uh, recovering some mysteries about these manipulations if there are manipulations or not. So this is the most interesting thing at the moment we are doing. That's awesome. Sounds sounds great. And well, uh, guys, I can't thank you enough for joining me today. Uh, I know it was a bit of an interesting start with the uh, new setup, but it is feels like it all went relatively smoothly. I'm going to have to check the levels later and hope that okay. everything Good. went fine. Fingers crossed. Thank you so much for joining me and thanks so much for listening to the Digital Music Trends show. Of course, you can find out everything on digitalmusictrends.com and you can also head to sxsw.digitalmusictrends.com for uh, the uh, s- uh, s- special site with the media feeds coming in for South by Southwest from uh, tomorrow, Thursday up until the 16th of March. There's going to be a special show next week recorded from Austin and I'm probably going to throw in a couple of the interviews that I will have done earlier in the week uh, from uh, South by South well, uh, uh, South by Southwest as well. Uh, thanks so much for listening. Have a fantastic week and until next time. Bye.